you haven't seen part one of this video of the migration series where I talked about Noah being Aboriginal to the Americas, you should probably check that out. Because right where I left off of that video, I'm gonna start off of this video. Basically talking about the migration from after Noah's time all the way until Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, etc. was, you know, civilized. And I'll be proving that these lands are actually in the Americas. But may you be warned, the points I make in this documentary will seem quite unsettling and maybe even ridiculous. But in order to understand any new thing, you must first cast away all previous teachings, or better yet, indoctrinations that you have received from public education ever since you were five years of age. Everything you were taught has been utter nonsense. You were not taught history, you were taught his story. You were not taught science, you were taught scientism, a religion based off a of theoretical pseudo ludicrousy. A lot of it is a lie. Or should I say, all of it is a lie. Europe is a lie. Africa is a lie. America is a lie. Australia is a lie. All of these are titles given by a people who are not even aboriginal to those lands. North, East, South, and West are lies from what we know of the Arctic Circle and even to Antarctica are all organized lies. Ocean is a Pulaskian Greek name and let us not forget that Ocean is a Yoruba goddess of water. Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and Arctic are all lies. Earth's tilt is a lie. Earth's axis is a lie. The South Pole is a lie. Gravity is a lie. They lie to you about evolution and humans and civilizations and cultures and religion. They lie to you about the Jews, the Egyptians, the Native Americans and slavery. They even lie to you about the trees. And if you accept these as truths, then your life is a lie. If they can lie about small things, they'll try harder to lie about big things, like the people who are chosen by the Creator Himself, the Israelites. If they lie to you about our nationality, our identity, our God, our culture, our language, and our laws, what will make you think they'll tell you the truth about your land of origin? The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thou peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up thine head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and have consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Itinerium Bergenales was the first book outside of biblical records that supposedly documented the journey through the Holy Land. This work was published in 333 AD. During that time, Flavius Dalmatius, the half-brother of Constantine, and Domitius Xenophilus we're joined together to commission this anonymous author to write this book. This was only less than a decade after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. The point of the council was to unify Christian doctrine throughout the Holy Roman Empire. In order to do this, Rome's paganism and Christianity had to mix. Their next step was to change the locations of the lands themselves. Before this book, not a single map or book of the Holy Land existed in the Middle East. 
No Greco-Roman map during this time or before this time can be trusted. According to scholars, none of Ptolemy's original maps even exist today, as far as we know. But the ones we do know were reconstructed by Byzantine monks under the direction of Maximus Planudes shortly after 1295. Ptolemy was later known as a major fraud for hiding all lands south and west of the Sahara and east of modern day India. And he also spread the idea that water covers five sixths of the entire planet. But what most people fail to realize is that Claudius's greatest inspiration in cartography was Strabo the Greek. Strabo supposedly lived during the time of JC, but in his maps, there is never any mention of Israel, Jerusalem, Palestine, or any Hebraic biblical term in the Middle East. It does mention Egypticus and Ethiopia, but those are not Hebrew names, but Greek. Nimrod was the fourth generation after the flood. During his time, there were only 35 other men in his generation on earth mentioned in Genesis 10, not including women. With that being said, we can estimate the total world population to be just a bit more than 200 at the highest. These people were descendants of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, but were all one tribe with the same language and the same customs. Migration is a natural human instinct, especially when you are like these people who don't have an inheritance of land to call home. During this time, maybe even before Nimrod's generation, mankind moved west from the east and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. Given the fact that they were already in Ararat of Turkey, if they were to go west, then they would have to go through Europe. And surprisingly, Europe is nearly only half the size projected on Mercator maps. It would only take 25 days at least and 50 days at most to cross the entire landmass of Europe from Turkey on foot. By the end of these days, this tribe will get to the Hadekel River, which is north and west of Atlantis at this time. Keep in mind that during this time, all the continents were connected into one supercontinent. Therefore, on the other side of this river, connected to Europe, was North America, specifically the region ranging from New York to Eastern Canada. This land was fairly fertile with a mega-sized Mississippi River to the west and a Hadeco River toward the east. This is the land of Shinar. And in Hebrew, Shinar literally means land between two waters. There this tribe with Nimrod the son of Cush as their leader began to build a tower to rebel against the Most High. Nimrod was called a mighty one in Genesis 10 and 8. This is the same title given to the giants in Genesis 6 and 4. The Hebrew word for mighty in this text is Gabor. However, in Genesis 18 and 18, Abram is told that his offspring will be a mighty nation. The Hebrew word for mighty in that text is not Gabor, but Atsum. Gabor and Atsum are actually two different meanings. Gabor means physically strong, large, and powerful, while Atsum means numerous, plentiful, and great. So the Hebrew text literally describes Nimrod as a physically brood, strong, large, and powerful man, just like the Nephilim were described. So as we can see, meanings can easily get lost in translation, and the strength of these people shortly after the flood can explain the megalithic stones scattered and stacked 
around Irving, Massachusetts on the Rattlesnake Trail near the Rattlesnake Mountains. Archaeologists agree that these stones are actually large bricks carved by man, but the origin of these stones still remain a mystery. These stones are also found in many other places of the New England territories. But there is actually a large chance that these bricks are the remains of the Tower of Babel and Babylon's civilizations. Psalms 137 in verse 8. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed? Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Genesis 11 and 2 in the King James says plain, but the Hebrew says valley, which indicates that the tower was built in a mountainous region, which is perfect for Irving, Massachusetts. Scriptures such as Psalms 137 and 8, Jeremiah 51 and 1, and many more prophesied Babylon being destroyed and laid desolate. That includes the tower and the entire civilization around it. Scripture never clarifies exactly how the tower was destroyed. All we know is that the tower was to be destroyed and that it does not stand today. And the indigenous Tohono Ahadam people of Arizona holds that mankind escaped a great flood then became wicked and attempted to build a house reaching to heaven but the great spirit destroyed it with thunderbolts scripture doesn't say thunderbolts or lightning but we don't know exactly how the tower was destroyed but whether this great civilization was destroyed by a great wind a hurricane an earthquake or thunderbolts it is very clear that this ancient empire is nothing more than rubble and bricks with a greater empire now resting upon its soil not only was babel built in shinar but also Erech, Akkad, and Kalna was built in the land of Shinar, according to Genesis 10 and 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And out of that land went forth Ashur, and built in Nineveh in the city of Rehoboth, and Kalna. Let us first focus on Akkad. Ironically, Akkad is the root word of Akkadia, which is in North America. Acadia is actually a French rendering of the original name of the territory. The indigenous Alonquian tribes of that territory called the land Acadi, which means fertile. This is why I refer to the eastern coast of America as the true fertile crescent and not that foolishness desert over there in the Middle East. Ironically, Akkad is the root word of Acadia, which is in North America, in the exact same location as Shinar, specifically from Maine to eastern Quebec of Canada. In Genesis 10 and 11, we see that Ashur also sprang out of Shinar. Ashur was the son of Shem and also the progenitor of the Assyrians. So it's no wonder both the Babylonians and the Assyrians spoke and wrote in ancient cuneiform Akkadian. Both Assyria and Babylon were centered around Akkad of Shinar. There is much archaeological evidence supporting what would be considered as ancient Akkadian or Sumerian artifacts found in the Americas. For example, a clay tablet with Akkadian dialect written on it was found in 1963 in northwest Georgia near the Kataochi River. Another Akkadian tablet was found in the possession of Chief Joseph of the Nass Pierce tribe of the Pacific Northwestern region on the complete opposite side of the United States. 
this tablet was translated and it translates to Nalu received one lamb from Abishaga on the 11th day of the month of the festival of An in the year of Inma Galana which was installed as high as the priests of Nana. More artifacts were found in Bolivia that actually hold a Sumerian connection. Idols of Sumerian gods such as the Sumerian gods of the sea, gods with wings, gods with the heads of eagles and the bodies of oxen and other Sumerian gods were discovered in Bolivia. As we can see, these artifacts are scattered all around the Americas, which makes sense because Assyria of Shinar was always an active empire that tried to acquire as much territory as physically possible. Whenever you see Assyrian or Babylonian artifacts in the Middle East, and they tell you it's specifically from a place in the Middle East, just know that all of these artifacts were found after 1492. Just know that the majority of these artifacts were found after the 1800s and the 1900s. Just know for a fact that if these artifacts can fit in a car, or can fit in a wagon, or can fit in a boat, or can fit in a plane, they can easily be smuggled to a new region and they can easily lie about where that artifact originates from. It's actually very simple. We must understand that artifacts alone cannot determine physical location of its territory of origin, especially for empires that are known for their migration. But we can use the context clues found in the scriptures to locate these lands. I can prove Assyria to be mainly based in the southeast portion of North America using scripture. And the name of the third river is the Hadekel, that is which goeth toward the east of Assyria. The Hadekel river flows toward the eastern border of Assyria. Now understand where Assyria is located in the Middle East today no river specifically flows out of Mesopotamia into the east of modern-day Assyria. In fact, scholars would say that the Garden of Eden is in Mesopotamia, but scriptures say that these rivers flow out of Eden. But these rivers in the Middle East don't flow out of Mesopotamia. They flow out of the Turkey region and they flow into the Persian Gulf or the so-called Persian Gulf. They only pass up the modern day Eden, but they don't flow out of the modern day Eden. During the period before the flood, all the continents were connected and the only thing separating them were the four primordial rivers mentioned in Genesis chapter 2 that flowed out of Eden. It wasn't until the time of Peleg that the earth was divided. According to Genesis 10 and verse 25, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now some people would read this and say the earth is not dividing, it's just the people are dividing. But why does the Hebrew literally says the earth was divided? It didn't say the people were divided, it said ha aretz. The earth itself was divided. The land itself, the continents itself were divided during the days of Peleg. But anyway, the modern Atlantic before it divided into the Atlantic was at one point this Hadekel River. Many scriptures, especially Isaiah 19 and 23 and Genesis 25 and 18, suggest that Assyria borders Egypt. In fact, out of every place Assyria is mentioned with, it is mentioned with Egypt the most. In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. 
but who are they serving? And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. In a Middle East map, Egypt is nowhere near Assyria. Zechariah 10 and 11 shows that both Assyria and Egypt border a rough and stormy sea. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and smite the waves of the sea. And all the deeps of the river shall dry up, and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. A tempest or hurricane is the most popular term for these sea storms. A storm from the Mediterranean would not at all affect modern Egypt or modern Assyria, but the Atlantic still holds the record. Zechariah 10 and 11 also denotes that Egypt and Assyria share one river and that when the river dries up, both Egypt and Assyria will be affected. But sooner than later, a new Assyria arose. Assyria was an empire, so like every empire, it tried to occupy as much territory as possible. According to Ezekiel 31 and 3, Assyria spread beyond the Euphrates and all the way to Lebanon, which is the northwestern area of the United States the land of the giant redwoods, the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon means white mountains in Hebrew, but it's mostly known for its pristine jungle of giant cedars that Solomon had chopped down and shipped into the sea. The cedars that grow in modern Lebanon, scientifically called Cedrus Lebani of the Middle East, will grow to be an astounding 130 feet. But these trees are still nothing compared to the California redwoods that stand 379 feet tall and not to mention Lebanon was also known for its wildfires that were often to be expected so where is the real Lebanon where is the land of these large trees where is the land of these wildfires where is the land of these white topped mountains? I mean it's right under your eyes and to be made plain and simple the true Lebanon is Northern California. But this can definitely explain the presence of Assyrian artifacts found in the Pacific Northwest. Because at one point the Assyrians went into Lebanon. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shrewd of an high stature and the top was among the thick boles. Besides Israel itself, Assyria was the strongest Shemitic empire in the Americas. They conquered numerous lands near and far and enslaved many nations, including the Egyptians and even the Babylonians. Despite the power of Assyria, they were only the predecessor of Babylon. Eventually Assyria fell and Babylon rose. Babylon, just like its predecessor, was a strong and powerful empire as well. At one point, the Babylonians went into the land 
and completely spoiled it from the Euphrates even into the Egyptian river. 2 Kings chapter 24 and verse 7 And the king of Egypt came not again any more out of his land, for the king of Babylon have taken from the river of Egypt unto the Euphrates all the land that pertained to the king of Egypt. But wait a minute. From the Nile River to the Euphrates is not even Egyptian territory. It's supposed to be Shemitic territory. Am I correct? But at one point, the Babylonians went into the land of Egypt and completely spoiled it from the Euphrates unto the Egyptian River, from the Mississippi unto the Colorado River's Grand Canyon. In the Middle East map, however, from the Euphrates to the Nilos River is not all the land of Egypt. In fact, it's Israel's territory. But if you look at North America from the Mississippi River to the Grand Canyon makes a lot more sense. The entire territory of Louisiana all the way to Arizona southward is the land of ancient Mizraim. Middle Eastern counterfeit titles of biblical lands were placed in a crafty but awkward position. Historians continue to ignore the hundreds if not thousands of artifacts, pyramids, and other evidences found in the Americas that point toward a comedic civilization in this land. But what does that mean for Babylon though? The location of Babylon can easily be explained through scripture. In Ezra 7 and 9, by the good hand of Yah upon Ezra, it took Ezra only five months to walk from Babylon to Jerusalem. This was considered to be a pleasant amount of time, hence why it said by the good hand of Yah upon him. It could have took Ezra a year or longer, but on a Middle East map, the walk from modern Babylon to modern Jerusalem would only take less than nine days. Five months would be way too long, especially for the good hand of Yah to be upon you. Ezra had to be traveling at least two to three thousand miles to take this long. Jeremiah 51 and 42 denotes Babylon being near a destructive sea with flooding waves. Jeremiah 51. How is Shishak taken? And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How has Babylon become an astonishment among nations? The sea has come upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. Jeremiah 51 and 42 denotes Babylon being near a destructive sea with flooding waves, just like Assyria and Egypt. In the Middle East, the chance of a hurricane occurring is highly slim. But Zechariah 10 and 11 also denotes the rivers of Egypt and Assyria drying up. But the Nilos of Egypt is extremely beautiful and well watered. And the Tigris and Euphrates flood every spring while the Nilos floods every July. While the Mississippi and Colorado Rivers Canyon have dried up exceedingly, but these rivers in the Middle East and in Africa have not dried up at all, but continue to flood their banks. But like I've said before, with the Atlantic being the strongest and the roughest body of water on the entire planet, it would make more sense for it to be the same sea mentioned in Jeremiah 51 and 42 and Zechariah 10 and 11, especially considering that the currents of the Mediterranean flow west, away from the mainland of the Middle East. So it's very unlikely for a storm from the Mediterranean to even come into contact with that land. Uh, uh, judgment will take place in America, the separation will take place in America, and the destruction will take place in America. Doom!
will take place in America. Doom!